And so I'd like to thank the Humane Society for uh, both inviting us here and also co-sponsoring this effort now for five years running, and also Dr. Rutberg, who's been a partner in crime on this from the very beginning as well. It's been a real privilege working with both of them. Uh, we're enormously proud of participating in what really is the uh, first dense suburban experiment of this sort. Uh, I'll also add, uh, besides being proud of that, very proud that we were actually made fun of on Saturday Night Live about this program. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, lying there in bed watching TV with my wife, I've got to tell you this story. She's asleep, and this program had gotten a bit of play in the news because uh, it was unusual and it just kicked off. And weekend update, uh, Seth Myers, up pops a picture of a deer uh, against the state of New York outline. And I knew right away it was about us. <laughs> and I was, you know, elbowing her awake up. They were about to make fun of us. And, uh, you know, uh, a community in upstate New York, because of course, four miles north of the Bronx is upstate New York, <laughs> uh, is trying to control its deer population with contraception and the only one who cares, and up pops a picture of a deer dressed as the Pope, is, is the deer Pope. And actually, that's not a bad lead-in to the topic I'm covering first, which is why this worked in Hastings. Nobody cared other than the deer Pope, and that was one of the drivers that, uh, in our decision to, to go with him, you know. So uh, we, when I ran nine years ago, uh, I was surprised how much I heard about the impact of deer on, on people in Hastings. And it was both a combination of a, a real serious epidemic of Lyme disease within the community and quite serious impact on property. And uh, so we put this at the top of our list of things we would get to, looked at lethal approaches because what do I know? That's what I went for first actually got a permit for net and bolt in New York State, the first to get that, and began to look at the mechanics of that implementation and realized that culturally in Hastings, doing that on an ongoing basis simply wasn't gonna work. It simply wasn't gonna work. Uh, we are, uh, I would say, a liberal, democratic, largely community. Uh, the hunting contingent in town is small, under, under 100 people. And uh, imagining setting up stations where net and bolt happened, mechanically, there would have been an outcry every year into perpetuity. And you don't engage in a lethal approach if you're not willing to engage in it into perpetuity because that's what you're doing here. And so... Uh, I was wrestling with that and it was approached by a woman, Barbara Stagno from, um, oh, what was the organization? In Defense of Animals. And she presented the uh, research work from Dr. Rutberg's efforts and talked me into reaching out to Dr. Rutberg. And so we headed down this pathway. Uh, we're a dense uh, quarter acre zoning suburb. Uh, we've got a few parks that are uh, of, of any size. Uh, hunting would have been impossible, whether uh, bows or rifles, which isn't actually allowed in Westchester, uh, because of a restriction in New York State, and at that, that time it was 500 feet, that you couldn't hunt within 500 feet of a school or uh, a house that hadn't given you permission. So that would have restricted us to a little narrow belt within the one woods we have of any size, and most deer live in people's backyards. So uh, Barbara Stagno came to me and it was a fertile moment uh, and we decided to head down this road. So selling this to the community actually wasn't enormously difficult because of the cultural issues in Hastings. Uh, those who rolled their eyes and, and were you know, cynical about the expenditure of public monies here on this effort, were small in number and weren't the sort who would, you know, stand around with picket signs protesting, which we would have undoubtedly encountered if we had gone in a lethal direction. 
So we simply didn't encounter any significant vocal opposition to this. And people were so desperate to see something done that they were willing to give us a shot. We also had uh, the support uh, financially of in defense of animals and also uh, the fact that this was a joint project with Humane Society which was picking up much of the costs as well. So the you know, impact on our you know, proverbial bottom line was around twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a year and that's even in a budget our size which is not huge it's, it's white noise it's not much to matter. So the sell to the community was actually um, pretty pretty easy. Uh, we communicated heavily out about what we're doing and why we were doing it. There were a couple of community forums where we discussed what we were going to engage in. Uh, and uh, to date, we've encountered very little opposition, which has allowed us to sustain this for five years without any you know, proverbial political cost and uh, to give it a chance to actually yield results or hopefully yield results. And we're just now beginning to see something. So uh, I'm, I'm not gonna read from a slide that's deadly dull, uh, but um, you, you, you get the idea. We weighed lethal, discarded lethal, went for immuno, and have generally had the support of the community throughout it. Um, you know the implementation team, they've been here. I'm gonna turn the mic over to Dan, I was ridiculously fortunate to have a large mammal biologist in town who wanted to run for the board. So, uh, you know, finding a partner to do this with uh, and to help on the delivery was key. We pulled in a lot of a lot of people and engaged a lot of people in this effort. So it turned into uh, a, a community-wide uh, citizen science effort, which was a good deal of fun and. Dan, why don't you get into some detail? And then I have some show and tell materials here for later. <laughs> so I will say if, uh, a little bit about implementation. First of all, just to follow on what Peter said, one of the things that I have learned, uh, I really enjoyed this scientific, actually all the presentations today I think have been excellent. And so Stephanie and all of you who organized it, uh, congratulations, terrific job. Um, And I, um, of course, I'm a scientist, so I particularly like the scientific uh, presentations, but one of the things that I have learned in this project and other projects that I've been involved in is that it's clear that we do have technological challenges and uh, still plenty around this topic. But by far the most daunting challenges that we face in most of these issues that we're trying to address are the sociological the economic and the political. And that just is uh, a, something I keep running into uh, constantly and it makes you want to retreat back to the science because it's relatively easy. So um, in implementation, I, that, that carried through with, with our implementation in, in Hastings. Um, as you've heard, the, the, the science uh, and the whole study is really designed by Dr. Ruppberg. Um, and the Humane Society, uh, a key partner, Peter mentioned, it's really been uh, a partnership of, of the three entities then, including the village. And um, within the village, we had to have a lot of entities involved. The police department was very important. Um, the local veterinarian, our DPW, and a huge group of volunteers. And we started the project with a number of public meetings. Um, Stephanie and Alan attended those and uh, to inform uh, actually a quite large number of, of our residents about what the project would be about and to, to answer questions. And there were plenty. And we've continued to have many questions. This has been ongoing. And uh, at the same time, as Peter said, the, the, our residents really wanted this problem addressed. So um, we had a lot of engagement. And the first year, um, we actually had a, um, I think over 100 volunteers. So we had about 50 families that did the 
uh, hosting of a hosta, and, but many, many more uh, who wanted to be actively engaged in this program because they thought it was really interesting. And uh, the first year we had a police chief who was very concerned about safety and wanted to have uh, resident monitors all around the sites of where any kind of activity was taking place. And so we did that. Um, we learned from that experience. Uh, we got a new police chief. The police chief retired and his replacement didn't have those concerns and that really simplified the approach we were using. But we actually had a lot of disappointed residents who liked being involved in that activity. And, um, and that's, a lot of times that's the, what happens in our community is people want to be involved and uh, will be disappointed if they can't be actively involved. You see here the results of what happened. Um, and this has already been mentioned. Let me, I'm going to move backwards here. Whoops. Okay, well, this doesn't seem to be the president. We, we had some issues with uh, the presentation that was sent in, and this doesn't even seem to be the one. So, um, so let me go off of my notes here. Um, there were, I want to mention a couple of things about the implementation and issues that we ran into that I think are really worth um, paying attention to. We, it was, it's already been mentioned, um, this issue of if you dart a deer that's the, with an anesthetic, it's going to travel some distance before it drops. And you never know where that's going to be. And so the question of, you, uh, even if you're in a public park, you don't know that that deer is going to stop finally in that parkland. It may very likely end up in somebody's backyard. And so we realized pretty early on and by the second year of this project that this was potentially going to be an issue. And so we decided and we teamed up with our local high school environmental science teacher um, who had a number of students that wanted to be involved in projects and actually needed to, to have a community involvement for part of their studies. And we teamed up with them and we decided we would canvas neighborhoods and ask people to give permission ahead of time either to sign a permission, ship or permission slip or to get online and send us an email giving permission so that when the Humane Society darting team was around, they would know that there were certain properties where they already had permission. We, um, in order to not have them have to look up on a sheet of paper in the dynamic moment of having a darting opportunity, we had the students distribute to the community and all the residences that had given permission a little survey flag. So there were little survey flags all around the community which marked out properties that were known to be okay for darting. And I think that um, that proved to be a pretty important step. Uh, I think um, Kaylee, who's the lead darter in the, in the, the teams, can probably attest to that fact. We didn't get, we always, had fewer residents that were participating than we wanted, but I think it was it helped. It 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 provided a lot of opportunities. Kaylee probably won't get into this, and because she's going to talk about more technical aspects. So um, another aspect of community involvement had to do with the Humane Society darting teams themselves and their engagement with the community and. They can tell you there were a whole range of responses that they encountered, even though Peter does an excellent job of communicating to the community through regular emails and explaining what's going on. There's information on websites. Despite that, um, some people don't read their emails, some people don't get them, um, and there always are residents who don't really know what's going on, and they see the darting team around with the sign on top of their car or they see them with a dart gun and they might be surprised or they might be surprised when an anesthetized deer lands in their backyard. And so, you know, you can imagine all the different kinds of scenarios that take place. And so one of the things that um, I think the Humane Society teams did a superb job at this is dealing with the range of resident responses to what's going on in the community. And we're a, we're a very dense suburban community and houses are close together and 
all of those possibilities that you can imagine, they happened. And there, there were a couple of instances with actually very upset residents who said, you know, the deer was uh, in my backyard and the team came in and I didn't want them there. And the team I mean, it was one of the things they had to be prepared to deal with and I think they dealed with, dealt with superbly and just trying to calm them down and to explain what's going on and eventually things are fine. Um, on the other hand, there were residents who really were very supportive. In fact, most, I'd say most residents are very supportive of the program and actually invited the darting team into their houses, into their sheds, so that they could actually dart deer out of the windows of their shed and so on. So, you know, there's in a community that is pretty supportive of this program, there's still this range of responses, predominantly supportive. Another aspect of this having to do with, with our residents and, and as the program unfolded over the years is that, you know, there, one thing I've learned as an educator is that the first thing you have to try to address are misconceptions. Because if you don't effectively address them, you lay the groundwork for things not working very well. And so there are a lot of misconceptions about the program. And one of the ones that we had to constantly remind our residents is, you might see a doe with the tag in its ear with fawns. That's probably because that doe was pregnant before it was immunized. And, and that was a kind of, that lag effect was, has always been a challenge to explain to residents. And if they're not kind of diving even that deep into the methodology of the program, that doesn't make any sense. Why would they have fawns? This must not, must not be working. Another, another, two other kinds of responses or misconceptions, we had people immediately saying after the first year, wow, there are fewer deer around here. <laughs> and, and I think that goes to what's been called the placebo effect. And that you, you're doing something and so the perception is that, wow, this is effective. On the other hand, you can also have this other kind of response which is not working at all because I'm still seeing lots of deer. And so, the, um, we, we have a pretty educated group of residents in the village, lots of professionals and lots of people with science backgrounds. That doesn't mean that, that they're going to put on their science reasoning hat when they're dealing with an issue like this. And so uh, the, the fact that we're telling them, you know, we really don't have the data yet to support any statement about whether this is working and how it's working, we're waiting for that, and that's going to take year to year four or five for us to get that. And that leads me to uh, another point, which is that the long-term nature of any of these interventions that we make. And I think it, no matter what intervention that you take with regard to deer population, you're looking at a long-term process. I mean, I like to, you know, in, in New York's, in Westchester County, I think the, the last deer was killed in the very waning years uh, of the 19th century. And then in the early 20th century, there was a, an attempt to actually bring back the deer population. Uh, there were actually reserves formed and then those deer, they didn't work, but they let, just let the deer escape. And as a biologist, when I look at kind of overall what's happened with the deer population, it looks kind of like a biological geometric growth curve, kind of facilitated by the development of suburbs and edge effects and so on. So that's a long way of saying it's a, it's, a, it's a population dynamic that has been a long time in developing. And I've, most of us who've been in Hastings have seen this happen over the last 25 years. Where to the, initially it was really exciting to see a deer in our woods and then it became commonplace and then the next thing they're welcoming you when you pick up your morning paper. So that's been, a, you know, that's to me the steep part of this growth curve. And so what I've tried to explain to our residents is, you know, a problem that develops like that over a very long period of time, and we can, we can see the trend of development is, no matter what method we use, is not going to be changed. That trend is not gonna be changed in a short period of time. And I think that that's something all of us in this room are very familiar with and we know is the case. But I think as a dealing with our residents and as a public relations 
issue, I think that's a very important point to keep addressing. And so the sustaining of an effort, I think, is really one of the tougher parts of what we're doing. And we don't know, we still don't really have the numbers. And you saw the, the, the HOSTA curve, which looks very promising, and it'll be wonderful if next year we see that curve bend up even further, um, which would begin to actually make that look like uh, convincing evidence. But we know that whatever effects that we get are going to be derived from a very long-term effort. And to sustain that is not going to be easy through successive generations of, of village governance. And, um, and hopefully we'll be able to do that and we'll really be able to realize the, uh, the benefits of it. But it's not clear um, how we'll do that. And I think Peter is going to pick up from there. So briefly, the host, the, uh, host to hosta uh, is probably the one yielding a positive indicator right now. We have set up plots in the woods that we've fenced off to see if plants regenerate. And we've also staked equivalent size plots without fencing to see if there's any sort of regrowth happening there. We're way too early in the process to have an indicator yet on whether something is happening. Accident records, in the end, uh, we have somewhere between five and 12 a year of deer on car collisions, and those vacillate all over the place. It just isn't enough for uh, a trend yet to emerge out of the no noise. We had a system for uh, logging deer sightings online, which was a good indicator of where the deer population was, not a great indicator for actual deer counts. So. Uh, and, and then we had uh, and still have um, trail cameras that we mounted in a grid and uh, the effort to yield usable numbers out of that is pretty large. We've uh, successfully done that once and we're now looking for an alternate, an alternate way to do it because uh, the sort of grad student who's willing to look through 5,000 photos for nothing just uh, we're having a challenge finding those. So uh, lessons. Uh, before we do this, I sh show and tell, I promised. <laughs> Little sign on the deer feeding station, uh, dispenses feed without warning. <laughs> when I was demonstrating, showing off to my wife in the woods how the feeding station worked, I pressed a button and I got a face full of feed dispensed at fairly high velocity. <laughs> I, I fell backwards. I went home and made up the sign and stuck it on all the stations. <laughs> because the, the woods are full of kids. Yeah. And uh, these tripod looking devices are interesting. And <laughs> you worry about a kid in the evening approaching it and then getting what I got. So there's that. Um, we have these. Uh, one of our problems is dogs off leashes in the woods. And uh, that's something that scares off the deer and uh, is a problem. So we had these created and posted around, uh, which were almost completely ineffective because people really like to walk their dogs <laughs> off leash. <laughs> but we still try. Then finally, there was a mention of uh, the sign on top of the car and uh, it, it looking like one of those tripod signs like a New York City taxi. Uh, and the deer learned that if that car with that sign was in the neighborhood to take off. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, very basic on the side of the car, magnetic thing. And, you know, we're a community without hunting. And uh, these dart projectors, we didn't want to call them dart rifles or anything look like assault weapons. So to have a car slowly head down a street and a, what looks like a rifle stick out is, is not great. It would have elicited calls to the police. So putting this on the door was a way of warning people what's up. So that's show and tell. 
So uh, I, I've mentioned the importance of the cultural issues. Uh, you start out with safety. If people think there's any risk here, you're going to encounter endless resistance. So uh, much credit to the Humane Society teams. The, the emphasis on darting when there was zero chance of an accidental darting of an animal or person uh, what was very important to reassure people that this posed no risk to them. So that was, you know, front and center, day one, emphasized. We put the safety protocols online on the village website. And uh, I think that was reassuring to people that there were no risks here or, or minimal risks. The public involvement and engagement that Dan referred to and I mentioned creates a buzz in the community. People talk about these things at cocktail parties. They're kind of interesting. Uh, you're a bit of a celebrity if uh, this occurs in your backyard and you know everybody is uh, gathered around this deer doing their thing. And uh, those stories propagate out and it makes, uh, it makes the program interesting to people. And that's important. Uh, the emphasis on education that Dan uh, said was core to our program remains so. Every year, we've got to re-educate people on why we went this route, uh, because people forget. Newcomers come to town. Uh, the old naysayers continue repeating their arguments, even though we've addressed them a thousand times. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, even now, community Facebook pages are the bane of any politician's existence. They are a calamity, actually, to the civil service. But uh, every year, people will come out and say, well, if we shot the deer, we could give the meat to the homeless, and you know that, that whole trope. And you have to remind people, first of all, can you imagine uh, gunshots or, or bow hunting right behind your house. Can you imagine a deer unsuccessfully uh, shot heading down the street and dying on your child's front lawn during the birthday party with an arrow sticking out of its side? Uh, no. So, uh, you know, we, we go through these repeated efforts to remind people of why we're doing this and why it's the only choice, and it's, it's reasonably effective. Uh, and then on, on the implementation itself, uh, and it was brought up earlier by, by Tony, understanding the community is key. Uh, both the cultural aspects of the community, the physical lay of the land, um, the, the humane society teams were incredible. Uh, they got to know the deer intimately. They knew exactly how many there were in particular pacts and also what individuals were humans were problems. And you know, that, that understanding, uh, there were days. Uh, uh, so uh, that's, that's core to success. Uh, metrics that we've mentioned are hard. If you're on a tight budget, uh, Tony threw out a number during lunch. I, I cornered him because I'm so jealous of this, you know, 91% success and the numbers he throws around he threw out a number which feels right, that a decent deer count can cost you $30,000. That's three times our annual budget for this deer program. So uh, those metrics are difficult, and our reliance on the citizen science method of the host to hosta, which sounds corny, but it's being run by a doctor and is actually fairly rigorous, at least gives you something. We had reports that Deer behaved differently uh, and took different, uh, the, the formulation of the anesthetic required to bring them down was a little different in our community than it was down south. And their tendency to bolt a longer distance uh, in our community was a little different than experience elsewhere. There's regional differences apparently uh, that may require a protocol to be tailored to your neighborhood. Immigration is your enemy. That's probably not politically. I'll have to re work on work on rewording that. 
but, uh, you know, we say that, but uh, Dr. Rupper points out that we're not seeing much in either direction. I can count on three fingers how many of our deer with the ear tags have been reported outside of Hastings. They've actually stayed fairly local. And so while I say that, that was our perception initially, and it may not be so long term. Ultimately, you can never keep a suburb like ours in a dense environment deer free. You're going to have that population pressure if your neighbors aren't doing anything. But right now, it doesn't seem to be the, the issue we, we thought it was. And then the deer don't range far. That's, that, that is what we're finding. Uh, again, in the three instances, one actually was 10, 15 miles away. Uh, but the other two were within two miles of Hastings. So they've stayed close. Uh, deer don't stand still. So we had a phone number we set up for the public to call in during the darting season. And uh, these calls would route to the darters in the field. So the idea was that if there was a you know, group or whatever the term is for a bunch of deer crossing the street and somebody saw that, they could call it into the number and the, the darting team could head over in that direction. Um, Yes, but they rarely <laughs> they rarely <laughs> stayed still, <laughs> they, right? So uh, that was a that, that migration internal migration within Hastings was a constant challenge, and then the darting in a dense suburb is hard. That's a truism here. When you have quarter acre zoning, uh, and you know houses are close together, and there's children and pets and and people, it has its own challenges. Um, and, and that, uh, that's something we've wrestled with and the team has wrestled with, I think fairly successfully in the end, but uh, it's, been a, it's been a challenge. So that's the end of uh, our presentation. Um, thank you for... Uh